Johnny Dollar. Happy New Year, Johnny, and many of them, and may your shadow never grow less, and all that sort of stuff. And the same to you, cheerful Charlie. Yeah, only as Hal. What? Hal Kemper. You know, Eastern Liability and Trust. Hal, how are you? What's a good word? You, uh, you made any plans for dragging in the new year in the usual fashion? Oh, in my usual fashion, yes. Well, now, what's, what's that supposed to mean? Well, it means that instead of getting myself hooked into some big, noisy, drunken party... And then risking my one and only life among all the crazy drivers who'll be seeing double because of the parties they've attended. Here, here. Instead of greeting 1962 with a hangover headache, I have other plans. Oh, yes, I forgot. Hmm? That luscious little damsel you've been according all these years, Betty Lewis. Well, that's just the trouble, Hal. So what's the deal, Johnny? Quiet little supper, just the two of you over at her place with a log crackling on the hearth and <laughs> candles oh. on the table, all that sort of stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, Hal. And at the stroke of midnight, a glass of sparkling champagne to match the sparkle of her lovely eyes. How am I doing? I guess right? Not quite. Betty's out in Ohio spending the holidays with her folks. Oh, well, good. What's good about it? It means you have no plan. But, Johnny, I'll tell you what you do. Sorry, Hal, but I'm going to be sensible. Stay right here, have me a quiet little drink, listen to all the celebrations on the radio, get a good night's sleep, and start the new year cool, calm, and hope I can make a good one of it. Well, now, before you settle down, Johnny, how's about coming over here to my house for a few minutes? Hal, I'm sorry. No, no, I I want you to meet and talk to Dr. Albert Begley is all. Dr. Begley? The heart man? The heart man. Why? Because of something he's just told me about one of his patients who happens to be an important client of ours, a wealthy old widow by the name of Mrs. Nancy Cunningham. What about her? You come on over here to the house. Let Dr. Begley tell you. Hell, on New Year's Eve? Look, I thought I got over the point that I'd rather stay out of a car tonight. Let's wait until sometime in 1962, like tomorrow, maybe. Now, only one trouble, Johnny. If we do wait, if what Dr. Begley says is true, that nice little old lady might never live to see 1962. Oh? Yeah. I'll be right over. <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Liability and Trust Insurance Company, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the one too many matter. <laughs> Expense account item one four eighty for a tank full of gas from my car. Then for two solid miles, I had to duck and dodge a flock of the darn fool drivers who'd already started to celebrate, and far too many of them might end up on a slab in the morgue. When I got to Hal Kemper's house, I could see that he and his pretty wife, Doris, were planning the quiet kind of evening that I'd have been able to have had with Betty Lewis if she'd stayed in town. Hal immediately swung me into the den where Dr. Albert Begley was waiting. He was a short... Stocky, gray-haired, clear-eyed man of about 60, I'd say, with that rare combination of gentleness, kindliness, and quiet efficiency that makes for a good family doctor. Glad to know you, Mr. Dollar. Dr. Begley. And I'm particularly glad that Kemper here was able to get hold of you on short notice. Well, what I'm glad about is that Johnny had no plans for tonight, so there's nothing to keep him from going right on over there. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, just wait one minute. Go on over where? Have I walked myself into some kind of a trap that you two innocent-looking connivers have set for me? <laughs> yes, I think that's just about it. But believe me, quite necessary. Well, Happy New Year to me. I hope it will be. Now, I believe Hal mentioned Mrs. Nancy Cunningham to uh-huh. you. That's right, Doctor, he did. Well, after Mr. Cunningham died, leaving her fairly well provided for, by the way... So I understand. Well, uh, considering her heart condition, she did what I think was a very sensible thing. Moved into a little one-story, three-bedroom home that she can care for all by herself without any danger of overdoing it. Mm-hmm. It's uh, over on the western edge of town, just north of Homestead Avenue. Now, here I've written down the address for you. Doctor, um, you said a heart condition. Just how serious? Mr. Dollar, yesterday I would have told you that Nancy Cunningham would live on for, oh, oh five, six, seven, perhaps as many as ten more happy years. But now, after what I learned from her this afternoon, well, I suggest that you go on over to see her right away. Well, may I ask why, sir? Well, because of two people who will arrive there sometime tonight. 
Presumably just to give her a little company during this holiday season. Oh? No. And who are they? Her only living relatives. Two nephews. Donald Kingman and Walter Baird. They're the last of the line, Mr. Dollar, and uh, therefore Mrs. Cunningham's heirs to both her estate and, I understand, a considerable amount of insurance. Considerable is right, Johnny. Now, I've telephoned Mrs. Cunningham that you're on your way, and she'll put you up there just as long as necessary. Well, how long is that supposed to be? As long as those two nephews are with her. After that, we'll see. Well, now, Dr. Begley, just one minute. Yes, sir. Yes. Do you mind telling me just why you've taken it for granted that I'll go along with this? Not at all. You see, I am firmly convinced that one of those young men is going there for only one purpose. And what's that? To murder Mrs. Cunningham. Doctor, you really believe that one of her own nephews is going to see her just to murder Mrs. Cunningham? Mr. Dollar, I'm certain. And before it's too late, Johnny. What do you mean by that, Al? I mean, she called me just a few days ago. She told me that she's done all she wants to for them... She's going to change her policy to name some charity as principal beneficiary. What charity? Oh, it's just the trouble. I don't know. Probably some clinic or hospital or something. Anyhow, she said she'd talk it over with me sometime next week, but not before. So, meantime, the boys are still in. Well, the mere fact that they're going to spend New Year's Eve with her. Before huh? she can change her policy, Mr. Uh -huh. Dollar. Before they can be cut out of it, don't you see? The only time they ever went to see her before was when they needed money. But now, all of a sudden, they're being good-hearted Joes. Keep her company. Help her welcome in the new year, huh? Well, I don't believe it. I agree with the doc here that one of those guys is going to get her out of the way. While they can still benefit by it. You say one of them. And uh, you said that too, doctor. Well, which one? Walter Baird or Donald Kingman? Well, that's just it. Even though they've certainly never looked or act like the... Those sort who could do such a thing is still the evidence, Mr. Donald. What evidence? Well, during Donald's last visit, while he was away from the house, a couple of gunshots crashed through the window, narrowly missing her. Oh? The police were able to trace those shots to Donald? No, it was Donald who called the police, made them investigate. And if that wasn't done just to take suspicion off himself... Now, oh, just wait a minute, Hal. What did the police find out, Duncan? Nothing. They decided those shots were strays, fired by some careless youngster over in the woods. And they let go at that. I see. Well, it could have happened that way. You know? Yes, yes, I know, I know, I know. But I also know that when he was just a little tight, Donald was quite a rifle shot. Another thing, Mr. Yes? Dollar. That evening when he left, it was bitter cold. So the heat was on in the house. It was on low. She'd planned to leave it on overnight. But it suddenly went off completely. Well, now, Dr. Begley, I... Well, if I hadn't to happen to drop by and discovered where a small cotter pin had jammed in the regulating mechanism, where it could have been placed by a human hand, Mr. Dollar, you remember that. Why, do you know that she could have frozen to death that night? Doctor, you know as well as I do that neither of those things can be called real evidence of an intent to kill her. I don't believe it. Mr. Dollar... I believe that one of those boys, possibly both of them, are planning to kill her. And now that she's planning to change her insurance, they haven't much time. Do they know that? Well, they must. But you're not sure. Does it make any difference? Don't you see, Mr. Dollar, they don't get her insurance until she's dead. That's the point, Johnny. And unless she dies before she can change the beneficiary. Well... Don't you see, there can be only one reason why they give up the sort of big party or dance those boys would usually go to on a night like this and, and spend their New Year's Eve with her. Or am I just acting like a suspicious old fool? I don't think so. Are you, Johnny? I don't know, Hal. Tell me, um, where do Walter Baird and Donald Kingman live? Up in Springfield. Together? No, no, just a couple of apartments up there. Neither of them is married. Mm -hmm. How old are they, by the way? Oh, middle 20s. Don is assistant manager in a supermarket, and Walter... Walter has a job in a bank, I think. Yeah. Doctor, did Mrs. Cunningham tell you what time she's expecting them? Sometime this evening, she said. In other words, Johnny, you better get on your horse. Okay. I'll go on over and see you. Yeah? Oh, well, you must...
across to either Donald Kingman or Walter Bed. Don Kingman. Are you Mr. Johnny Dollar? That's right. Well, Happy New Year, and come in, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thank you. Old Doc Begley phoned our nurse just a little while ago and said you'd be here. Oh? And I say good, the more the merrier. <laughs> come on and meet my cousin, Walter Baird. Walter, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar, and you know who he is. I certainly do. Well, Walter. Glad to you, Mr. Dollar. Happy New Year. You too. Who is it, boy? Mr. Johnny Dollar, Aunt Nancy. Oh, good. Please excuse me, Mr. Dollar, but I'm still dressing for our little party. Oh, I surely, Mrs. Cunningham. I didn't realize how late it was. Well, at my age, it takes a bit longer to get ready than it used to. Well, that's perfectly all right. I'll be with you in just a few minutes. Well, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Make yourself comfortable. Sure. Well, my goodness. Looks like uh, you're planning a real evening of it. And with no pain. I think of all this food and plates, silverware, glasses, even the tablecloth and napkins in one of those catering places on the way in. Mm -hmm. Even that portable bar. See it over there in the corner? Mm -hmm. Tomorrow morning, they send a man around to pick it all up, and we won't even have to wash the dishes. <laughs> Good work, John. Pour the gentleman a drink, Walt. Yeah, I don't know why not. And while you're at it, pour me one, too, and one for yourself. The glasses are all set out. It's very sad and done. What will it be, Mr. Dollar? Oh, uh, scotch and soda will be fine, but a light one, huh? Right you are. Should have picked up a white over here. <laughs> well, I wonder why Aunt Nancy never told us that she knows you, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? She's been keeping things from us. Oh, has she? Well, it's about the only thing she has kept from us, I'll say that. Well, what do you mean, Wally? I'll tell you what he means, and I mean it, too. It finally got through these thick skulls of ours, and it's high time we started making up for all that Aunt Nancy's done for us over the years. Oh? Yes, sir. My folks died when I was only a kid, and then later Walter parents were killed in a smash-up. Well, if it hadn't been for Aunt Nancy, I don't know what we would have done. Mm. Here we are. Happy days. And many of them. Let's go. The point is, we finally came to our senses, and this little celebration tonight, well, it's, it's only going to be the beginning. Amen. Yeah, I'm afraid that repayment of our debts to her is long overdue, and that... Hold the phone. What's the matter? 9 p.m. already. On the nose, why? Well, did you put the champagne on there? Uh, no, I thought... Oh, son of a gun. Oh, now, don't tell me. I'm afraid so. The champagne's the one thing we forgot. Well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Don't I can... give it a second thought. There's a liquor store about ten blocks up the street. I've got my little blue coupe out front, so I'll be back here with a couple of bottles by the time you can whistle Dixie. <laughs> uh, tell me, Mr. Dollar, how long have you known Aunt Nancy? Mind if I ask you a couple of questions first, Don? Not a bit. Like me to sweeten that up for you first? No, no, thanks. This is fine. Well, I think I'll add a little scotch to mine. Walter makes them pretty pale. But, uh, go ahead with the question. Well, only what was that? Probably some crazy driver out there wrapped his car around a tree. Must have done a good job of it. Um, now tell me this, Don. Maybe Guy can anticipate a couple of your questions. No? Like, did Walter and I know Aunt Nancy was considering changing her insurance to cut us off? Well, did you? Frankly, Mr. Dollar, the answer is yes. Oh, is it? And, um, is that the reason you have suddenly decided to be nice to her? One of them. I'm perfectly honest about it, yes. At least, it was. None any more, though. You better explain that. She changed her mind tonight. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, but she told us about it tonight. Well, then you will get the insurance. Yes, we're still in. Instead of wiping us out and giving it to some heart foundation or going ahead with that... That sanitarium, she was going, she was going to build for all... Don, what, what, what's the matter? Don, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. No, I... Uh, I, I, I feel it too. I... I, this, this drink, I, 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 I can't... I know, I... I, I, I can't get out of my chair. Don, remember rolling off my chair onto the floor and then nothing for what seemed a century or two. Finally, in a sort of a daze, I could see a policeman standing above me and feel the flat of his hand slapping me in the face. <laughs> hey, all right. All right, come on, Dollar. Wake up. Wake up. Wait. Logan. That's right. 
Mr. Rogan. Only a Sergeant Rogan to you. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Another snort of his brandy. <coughs> now, what do you know about this fellow? About what? This other guy stretched out here the same as you are. Who is he? Oh, that's, uh, Don Kingman. Yeah? What about that body in there in the bedroom? Body in the bedroom? That's right. Well, old Mrs. Cunningham. Who's huh? dead with a bullet in it? Special memo to football fans. Tomorrow's thrilling Cotton Bowl game between the Mississippi Rebels and the Texas Longhorns will be a CBS Radio Network special on most of these stations. They say the man to stop tomorrow is the galloping halfback of the University of Texas, Jimmy Saxon. But the word's around that Mississippi has a pretty strong team, too. So be on hand for the exclusive radio coverage of the Cotton Bowl game in Dallas, Texas, tomorrow at your electronic 50-yard line. Rogan, you say that Mrs. Cunningham has been murdered? A 22 bullet right in the head. Good Lord. One of the other boys was up the street looking into a car crash. He heard the shot, radioed for me to get over here, and I busted my way in, and then... Uh... Well, what do you know about it? All I know is that Don and I were sitting here having a drink. First Don collapsed, and then it hit me. That was it, Rogan, a drink. Now, I'll say it was. You see the sediment here in the bottom of your glass? No, 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 no. Don't touch it. You don't touch anything until the lab crew gets here. All right. And there's more of that sediment in his glass sitting there on the table beside where he keeled over. You see this little envelope I found on the shelf under the bar? It's an orphine. Yeah. Looks like your and his drink were loaded with it. I couldn't even rouse him. Even this full glass over here has some in it. That's Walter's. Walter's glass, and he didn't drink any. So that was it. Yeah? What was Walter it? poured the drinks. Then, without touching his own, he left on an errand, or so he said. But instead, you mean, this Walter, whoever he is, came back here, killed the old lady? That his so-called errand was only to make himself an alibi, to make it look as though he wasn't here? All he had to do was show up at that liquor store. I thought that if anybody might try to kill her after all the big buildup I got... But I guess I was wrong. Hey, yeah, look, will you start making sense? Rogan, it looks as though all you have to do is find Walter Baird. Baird, huh? You got any idea where to find him? What time is it now? Uh, 10.40. Well, he can't have gone very far. Well, where'd you sit? Now, hold it a minute. Sergeant Rogan. Yeah? Yeah? It was who? Okay. You sending a lab crew over here? Right. Dollar, is your head clear enough now to know what you're talking about? Well, I, I, I think so. What time did Walter Baird leave you two here? Um, well, wait a minute. The, the, the mantle clock had just struck nine. According to my watch, well, let's see, um... Yeah, it's on the nose. And that crash down the block happened less than a minute after nine. Some drunk smashed into a little blue coupe that was coming from this direction. The blue coupe? Yeah, the drunk is dead and the other guy's in the hospital, but he'll get over it. And this other guy? Yeah, Walter Baird. So he couldn't have done this any more than Donald here could have. I mean, if Don passed out, like you say. But who then? You said you busted in. That front door was locked tighter than the drum. And there's no sign of anybody else having broken in. Well, the truth that Walter couldn't have done it. Well, then who? Dr. Begley? What? The way that he so carefully laid out to me all the reasons that Walter and Don had for wanting her dead? That is a cover-up, so I wouldn't suspect him? Yeah, well, now, and wait that a minute. charity that she might have left her money to? Some hospital or clinic, Hal Kemper told me? That's something Dr. Begley wanted money for? So much that he was willing to kill her? And as a doctor, an old friend, he'd have a key to the house, possibly. You sure you're feeling all right, Dollar? It wouldn't make any sense. Make no sense at all. You think you were making any? If he hadn't changed her insurance yet, and he must have known that, so killing her wouldn't do him any good. Dollar, listen. Yeah, what? We know that Walter couldn't have done it, okay? And we know that Donald couldn't have done it. So, that leaves you. Oh, let's not kid about it, huh, Rogan? Okay, then. Are you sure this doctor who might have a key would be more likely to know about the panorphine that was used on you? Anybody would know about that stuff and be able to get it. But are you sure this doctor has nothing to gain? 
The only ones who could possibly gain are Walter Baird. And he's out. And Donald here, who... Wait a minute. Well, Don couldn't have done it. Look at him. Wait a minute. Maybe I was a little befuddled from that from that drug, but... Look, this glass. This glass of Don. Ah, don't touch now. Just leave it there on the table. The point is, Rogan, did you touch it? Did you? Of course I didn't. I told you, Donald. Then that's it. it. It has to be. Dollar. Donald. Knocked out by the phenorphine? Sure he was. And still is. That's right, but not until after he killed her. Ah, but didn't you say that he... Listen to me now. Those glasses had the drug in them, all right. All three of them, to make sure that I'd get some of it. And not only you, but them, too. No. No, because if Walter himself hadn't suggested going out for the champagne, Don would have told him to, before Walter could touch his drink. And that ducking out would make Walter the only suspect in the murder. Well, of course. The only it's... thing that cleared Walter was the accident that Donald couldn't foresee. All right. Right after Walter left, Don took his drink over to the bar to make it stronger, he told me. Actually, was to get rid of the drug in it and pour himself a fresh one. Yeah, well, now he you came can... back here, took a couple of sips. And when he saw the stuff was beginning to hit me, he made like he was passing out. Then, when I fell on my face, he got up. Killed her, came back in here, poured some of the drug into his drink again, and passed out legitimately. And with what he thought was a perfect alibi that I would have to back up for him. Dollar, that's a darn good theory. And maybe that's the way it happened. What do you mean, maybe? When he comes to, we'll face him with it, and if he can prove otherwise, I'll eat your shirt. But whatever gave you the idea? The glance of his, Rogan, the fact that it is now sitting there on the table. Huh? He put it there after he'd done the murder. After? Yes. After he actually took the drug that made him really pass out. I don't get it. All right, listen. When he faked it, earlier, when the stuff hit me, Donald dropped his glass. Oh. Yes. It rolled onto the floor. It was one of the last things that I saw and heard. Look. See there? It left a little stain right there on the floor. Hey, all right. He dropped it to convince me that he was passing out. But now it's up on the table. And only he could have put it there, Rogan. Satisfying? When he came to, and we told him how he'd worked it, how he'd made the mistake of setting the glass back on the table, told him we'd made a paraffin test of his hand to prove our point. Well, Don not only confessed, he showed us where he'd hidden the gun. Expense account total? Four dollars and eighty cents for that tank full of gas. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, I'll be back with another case for you. But for now, I would like to wish all of you the very best of New Year. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnshaw, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Lawson Zerby as Dr. Begley, Ellen Manson as Donald Kingman, Matt Poland as Hal Kemper, Robert Dryden as Sergeant Rogan, Doug Parker as Walter Baird, and Ethel Everett as Nancy Cunningham. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Art Hannah speaking. <laughs>